in an effort to try to explain a little bit how I got there. I know you're focusing on alternative practices. Um, so most of you are trained as architects, but where will, you know, where can the career of an architect go? Well, I would say it depends on your obsessions and your fascinations. And one of mine has always been this, 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 this kind of thing, you know, the, the, the deposits of, of pollution that, that land upon buildings and the beautiful patterns and marks that they make on of these buildings. And so I found myself photographing them, becoming obsessed with them, you know, making artworks out of them from, from uh, a long time. And then I started wondering, you know, where's the stuff coming from? You know, well, you know, we know that it comes a lot of it from, from factories, but also from buildings themselves. Uh, because in fact, you can't make a building without making pollution. You have to heat it up, you have to move the materials around. So in fact, pollution uh, is part of, in a way, architecture. And here's a picture from 1907 in Chicago. Um, it's kind of hard to imagine the way in which the atmosphere was so different in the end of the 19th century from where it is for us today. When we go to a city, the sky is clear. But when it was when you went to a city at the end of the 19th century, the sky was dark, it was black. And in some cities, even more than in other cities, this is Pittsburgh called the smoky city for a reason, because in the middle of the morning, you couldn't see the light of day. These are pictures taken early in the morning, 11 a.m., and it looks like it's midnight and the lights are on. And of course, this had a ton of effects in the health of people, but it also created a kind of desire to take this stuff off. And the minute that after World War II, the uh, industry in the United States began to wane and we moved into what we called a post-industrial era, well, the first thing that people wanted to do was to clean these buildings. And here you see a scaffolding being taken in front of the first national bank. Um, and there was a great celebration and an idea that these buildings were being returned to their original condition, when in fact, this was never the case because these buildings were all designed to be polluted. They, the architects that were making these buildings knew very well that they were gonna be black within a couple of years. And so they used very modern materials like the ones here, glazed terracotta, which resists the effects of pollution. Um, but in any case, you know, this idea that we had to get rid of pollution, um, get rid of the, 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 the dust on buildings really took hold and began what is really now a kind of industry of facade cleaning, facade conservation, and in fact, of preservation. So a lot of the bread and butter of preservation work is actually cleaning buildings. And through the cleaning, there are some restoration, stabilization of the materials. But for me, what became interesting is asking, you know, why are we taking the stuff off the buildings? Uh, it, it, it doesn't harm the buildings. These buildings were designed to have this uh, material on it, this pollution on it. Uh, it, it. You know, it's not bad for your health. You're not breathing it. Uh, unless you're going up to these buildings and licking them or, or, or eating, you know, <laughs> some people really love architecture that much, you know, go, go, go hug a building and, and kiss it. But unless you're doing that, you know, this is really not that bad for you, certainly from a health standpoint. It's actually worse when you take it off the building because then, you know, it goes into back into the sky or it goes into a river. So it becomes more of a problem. So why are we doing it? Well, there's a kind of you know, cultural stigma associated with, with pollution. We feel it's, it's, it's bad. And so therefore we don't even want to look at it, even, even though it might not actually be bad for us when it's essentially paint on a building. So I got a commission to do a work in, um, at the Victoria and Albert Museum in response to their collection. And I was attracted to this, to this object on the left, the cast of Trajan's Column. Trajan's Column is in Rome. It's a first century monument built by Trajan to celebrate his conquest over the Dacians, which is now Romania, uh, and crossing the, the Danube. And the most famous thing about it is this bar relief that goes around and twirls up and the whole uh, column. And by the middle of the 19th century, they already in Italy had found out that the surface of this bar relief was actually eroding because of atmospheric pollution. And so they decided to make a cast out of it. And the, 
uh, Victor and Albert Museum acquired one of them and they installed it in 1872. And what I was amazed by is in pulling the pictures from their archives, I realized that inside this, this, this plaster cast, the way that they used to hold it up was to build a chimney. And they hired the same people that were building chimneys for factories. And to me, that was amazing. You know, that here's a work that is done to preserve something from pollution. And then they put it and basically the emblem, the symbol of pollution, the chimney. And so I wanted to, in a way, celebrate this chimney, map this chimney, uh, 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 account for the dust in this chimney. This was a kind of reverse chimney because in fact, you know, when you, uh, there was no, no boiler underneath it, um, the, the inside of the chimney was, you know, led, went to the floor, but because uh, museums were actually open to the sky, uh, the windows were open, they didn't have air conditioning, so all the dust was coming in and this, um, this was taking in all of the smoke from above. So it was like a chimney in reverse and here you see a detail of it. And what I'm doing here is I'm applying a paste, a, uh, a latex paste onto the walls of the, of the interior and that paste as, as it is a conservation latex and as it uh, uh, dries up, it begins to absorb all of the all of the dust into itself and just pulls it gently off of the wall. And so that makes both a cast and also a, um, a, um, a record of the pollution. So it cleans the building, but also presents you with a cast. And here we are, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pulling off the cast from inside the, the column and you can see what, what it looks like and how it, how it you know, comes off of the wall um, uh, of the. Now, this is this. What's interesting is this part of the of the of the work. This is their largest object in the Victoria and Albert Museum, but they didn't consider it uh, part of the collection at all. The, what they cared about was only the outside. This is considered like the backing of the work. So this chimney didn't have an actual call number or any kind of uh, you know reference within the museum. And I wanted to acknowledge this chimney as an object, and I and I wanted to acknowledge also the dust inside this chimney as uh, as an object. So as we pulled down the um, the material and got it off of the uh, the interior, which was quite a process because you know we we were working on a scaffolding and then had to pull it down. Um, uh, as we pulled down the scaffolding as well, <clears throat> then we brought it out and hung it next to the next to these two casts and. You know, of course, what you're looking at, there's three columns. The two on the right are the original um, plaster casts. The column, Trajan's column is so tall that they couldn't fit it inside the building. So they actually cut it in half and they put two halves, one next to the other. So the third column that you're seeing on the left, which is um, this latex, luminous latex, that's the sculpture that I uh, did, the cast that I did. And you can see on it, the pattern of the brick, the, 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 the dust on the column. And then there's a, there's a line that's very dark at the bottom, which is what was a ledge inside of the chimney. But for me, it was very important to put this dust in the museum and to show it as an artwork because this room in which it sat, this is, this is the cast courts. This is the poor man's tour of Europe. If you didn't, uh, couldn't afford the big tour to educate yourself and to travel and pay all the expenses to get yourself to Italy and through, Germany and France and Spain and whatever, uh, you went to the Victoria and Albert Museum as a, as a working class person and you could see copies of these works. And it was very important as a kind of um, refinement of the working class and elevation of the working class. Um, and it symbolized the highest achievements of Western culture in the realm of art and architecture. And for me, it was very important to put pollution inside this room so that we could actually begin to think of pollution as an artwork. Because if you read the anthropologists of the 1960s, like Mary Douglas, they will talk about pollution as a matter out of place. We don't have a place for this stuff. So it goes into a kind of outside world, a, a kind of imaginary world beyond 
culture. And, um, you know, it's kind of, it's nature, but it's also conceived of as nature that is the ultimate sink. You know, it's like the ocean, it cleans itself. The sky, it cleans itself. You know, that was the philosophy in the 19th century. Now we know that that's not the case, that the sky doesn't clean itself, that the dust stays there and the same goes for the ocean. So for me, it was important to begin to reckon with the fact that as architects, as artists, in fact, as a civilization, we just don't have a figure, we haven't figured out what to do with this material that we must make in order to, to make the work that we do. And we, as architects who make large quantities of it, we just haven't accounted for it. As a, and, and so we're in this idea that we're just gonna reduce, reduce, reduce. So is there another way to think about pollution? Maybe there's a way in which we can incorporate it into our work, incorporate it into culture and begin to think about it as in, in, in cultural terms and not, in, but also in material terms, that this is an actual material, that it has a physical property and that it is, uh, it has a history associated with it. So I wanted to, to kind of look at that history. This was a commission for uh, Louis Vuitton, who as you all know makes bags, uh, and they invited me to do a work for their private museum in uh, Paris. And so I began to do a little bit of research, Paris, and they, um, you know, looked at this, I looked at this, um, this painting, this is, you know, if you've taken Art History 101, you've seen this painting, it's uh, Georges Seurat, it's the beginning of pointillism, the, the breakup of form, the, you know, you're looking at, uh, instead of the brushstroke being a kind of linear brushstroke, this is the brushstroke that the artist is putting paint in, in little dots on the painting, so the figure is breaking up and you're getting a different kind of experience. And, and in my view, a lot of the reason why they started to break up is because the, the sky that they were looking through was actually quite different. It was not clear. It, was, it, was, it had this kind of dusty quality to it. But what's interesting for me is, of course, if you're interested in pollution, it's like, you know, you see it everywhere. But look at the back of this painting. You see in the back, you see their chimneys. And I, I hope you can see my cursor, right? But these are the chimneys in the back. And as it turns out, well, of course, there's one that's on, right? There's like that one is, is, is spewing pollution. We know it's a Sunday because the other ones are off and everybody's resting and kind of hanging out on the, on the Seine. So the chimneys in the, on Sundays when they shut down, they didn't produce smoke. But these chimneys over here are one of them. We don't know which one exactly uh, was the chimney of Mr. Louis Vuitton's factory. And so that's why I became interested in, in this painting. And this is Mr. Louis Vuitton's factory to the right with the white glazed brick. That's where that chimney was right behind those windows. And that's the part that has been turned into a private museum now. Now to the left, you see this kind of buff colored brick structure. That was Mr. Louis Vuitton's house. So he literally lived right in front of his factory. And he would look out this window over here and look at the materials going in and look at the bags going out. And of course, when they were starting this museum, they, you know, they asked me to do a work for it. And I proposed to clean the house of Mr. Louis Vuitton. But what had happened was that it had already been cleaned because when the Louis Vuitton family sold the whole company to LVMH, they cleaned the whole house and turned it into a kind of entertainment venue uh, for VIP clients. But so I was looking, I was trying to search for the smoke and the pollution from this factory. And it was actually quite hard to find some, a lot of the stuff has been, has been removed and there's very little evidence left of it. But if you look closely over here, the buff colored brick, I noticed that this brick was actually a little bit redder than this one. And actually, as it turns out, this was an addition that was put in when that property was sold to LVMH to, hope, to, to have a place in which to uh, put the garbage. And so that's where I went in and I saw that they had not cleaned that part. And so we cast that part of the building, class the, the, the garbage area, the garbage room, and made these casts, which you can see here on the right. That's the, that's the garbage room. And so on the left over here is the entrance to the museum where my cursor is. And the first thing you would see is the pollution, the kind of dust that was created by the factory itself. And then looking left, you would see a portrait of Mr. Louis Vuitton in the famous steamer trunk designs, which he came up with that were going on the boats that were coming to America, that were going to Africa to colonize Africa and so on. So in the first thing you see is both the product 
and the, 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 the externality of making this product, the dust. And this was quite a, uh, I have to say, courageous decision on the part of the um, curators to show the stuff to, as, you first, as you first come in. Of course, it has that kind of gold feel to it. Uh, but that was very important for me that, that, that they would show that because normally that dust is not accounted for. And here, um, uh, of course, here's a picture of the Tower of London um, in which you can clearly see the top has been has been damaged. This, the, the limestone in particular reacts to the sulfur in the stone and becomes gypsum and then kind of you know dissolves away. And so that you can see at the top. Now on the bottom, those are replacement stones, the ones that look very, very sharp. Those are replacement stones that as the stones have decayed, we put new ones in. Now for me, what's interesting in this is, when we think about environmentalism and we think about you know, the role that architects have in all of this, you, know, you look historically and preservationists, artists, architects have been at the forefront of thinking and understanding and even discovering climate change. This kind of decay is what inspired Robert Angus Smith who was a, a preservationist. He was a Scottish preservationist, trained as a chemist in Germany, but he started looking around the buildings in the, in the United Kingdom and Manchester and other places and seeing that they were dissolving. And he, he, he asked himself, how, why is this happening? So he did, the, he did this, the collecting the rain and speculating on it and figured out that there was acid in the sky. And he published a, a book towards uh, chemical climatology, which is now considered one of the you know, founding books of environmentalism. So here you have somebody that's looking very closely, that's able to actually pay attention, and that through those just very basic with their eyes, observing with their eyes, is able to then take that into a whole life career of a, a, a research. And so, you know, I would encourage you guys to look, to look around you, look at, look at the buildings around you because things are happening at the microscopic scale, at the macro scale, and they're new materials. Um, you can, you can, this, this is really a very interesting area of, of research. Um, to go into now, of course, there's some dramatic pictures like this one, right? Over 60 years, this 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 whole this whole sculpture kind of melted. This is the Ruhr Valley. This is the Rust Belt of uh, Germany. This is the most polluted area of Germany. And of course, this is a picture that was used in order to pass environmental regulation. But artists have been at the forefront of environmental regulation. Uh, because they've been looking, because they actually are paying attention to what's happening around. And here, uh, Sir Richmond, who was a painter, uh, an artist, uh, founded the Coal Smoke Abatement Society in 1898. This was the first environmental protection um, uh, uh, society in, in the United Kingdom. Now, Robert Angus Smith had preceded him a little bit earlier in Manchester with, um, with the alkali inspectorate where he had figured out that the real problem in the acid rain was the alkali that they were putting in for, to catalyze the chemical reactions in the factories. And so he started to try to pass policy to reduce that. But here you see him mocked, you know, people are looking at Sir Richmond and they're saying, oh, he's like a marionette, he's not gonna get anything done, but boy, did he get stuff done. This, this, this became one of the most powerful environmental societies that's still going today. Um, and you know, they, these, these things take time, but he, uh, he certainly initiated the, 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 the work that now allows us to continue to understand climate change and to deal with it. And another person that for me has been very, very important and from which um, actually these works take their name uh, from his work, um, the Ethics of Dust. The Ethics of Dust was a book written by John Ruskin in the 19th century. Uh, and John Ruskin was an amazing polymath. He was a artist, he was a writer, he was a critic, he was a preservationist. Uh, and he looked very closely and intently at buildings. And in particular, this building at the Doge's Palace, you can see on the left, he, he took this photograph of it uh, with Hobbes, 
where you see the building is black. It, it, it's really contaminated. It's, it's, it's got a lot of pollution on it. And look at it on the right. It's all clean, right? On the right, it has been cleaned. And now buildings, you know, buildings used to be maybe on a cycle of being cleaned every 75, 50 years. Now they're cleaned every 15, 20 years. We, we have this expectation that the great monuments of the world are going to be completely shining. But that cleaning is actually damaging to these buildings because people are power washing these stones and actually basically dissolving the surfaces. So the Doge's Palace is a great case in point because many of the column capitals of the Doge's Palace have actually had to be removed and the originals placed into a museum and replaced with replicas that they can continue to power wash. So the cleaning, you know, it, it is not negligible. And when I was invited to do a work for the Venice Biennale, um, I looked at the Doge's Palace. I was fascinated. You know, I was on the on the on the tracks of of John Ruskin, and uh, I found that actually one wall inside the Doge's Palace had never been cleaned. It was this is this is Piazza San Marco. This is the Great Gallery facing Piazza San Marco, and behind it is the is that wall. But because you can't see it from Piazza San Marco and you can't see it from the interior courtyard the wall has been left sullied because nobody wanted to pay for it. You know, if no tourist is going to see it, why, why should we pay for it? And here you can see, you know, that arch that has been power washed. You can see how bright white it is. And this has not. So we did some tests. It's been the first time at that time that a building in, in, in Italy had been cleaned um, a monument with latex. So we had to do a number of tests. And here we you know, using that same process, we're pulling the latex off the wall. You can see it over there. And here we're pulling, uh, you know, you can see the dust coming right off the wall. And here you see the, 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 the final cast uh, in, in relationship to the wall where it came from. That's the wall clean. So you can see that actually the color hasn't changed that much. It's a little lighter gray, but the, 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 uh, the um, latex really removes a very little part of the surface of the of the um, of the stone. So it actually makes it um, uh, you can see still the difference with this power wash stuff. It's very light kind of cleaning. And you know I, I allow myself to work very intuitively in a lot of projects. I, I will dive into a project and see what comes of it and then try to learn from it. you know I go in a sense backward to what, we, we normally teach in school, we normally teach like do a lot of research, do a lot of research. And once you've got the research figured out, then, you know, then you do your project. When I kind of just do the project and then, and then do the research afterwards, like what, what was going on here? What, what did I do? And I learned, but I, I look at the work and try to see what comes of it. Look at this line over here. I wasn't expecting this line, this, this line and this line. There's a black line through the middle of the cast. And it coincides directly with the mortar joints of the limestone. You see that over there? That like, I was like why did that turn black? That mortar didn't look that black. Well, as it turned out, you know, the mortar fell off at a certain point and a, and a, and a crafty restorer went in and filled it back in. But as you know, lime is white. And so there was a jarring contrast with the blackness of the of the stone so we the the the, the um, restorer must have gone back in and with paint and just painted that in infilled it with black paint so so that it all would match and then when i cast it that paint came right out so i was like oh my god i can't believe that they were painting pollution on the walls that's sort of interesting so i talked to a lot of the uh, in particular, the team that was across the, the, the piazza because they were cleaning the, um, the, the uh, mint of the Venetian Empire. The Venetian Empire, by the way, that lasted 800 years, you know, an amazing naval empire. And that was where they minted their money and the building across from the, from the, from the doge, from the, from the king, from the, you know, they had a kind of dem, a pseudo democracy. I mean, they had, they, they, they had, they elected among the nobles, a king. And uh, that was the palace, the doge's palace on the right, on the left, you see, but look at what they were finding. They had their scaffolding up. You can see this is, this is the, the, the big kind of ministry building. This is the Doge's Palace on the left, if you can see that over there. And they had their scaffolding up. So I go up on the scaffolding and we're looking at this stuff. And they said, I said, yeah, have you guys seen any of this painting on, 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 on buildings? Said, this whole building was painted black. That stuff that you can see at the bottom that you think is pollution 
it is mostly paint from the 19th century. You know, and I, that, that was really a discovery for me. Why did they paint that black? And nobody really knows. There's no real historical document that really attests to why, but the theory is that the Venetians being really dependent on the you know, tourist money from the British and the Brit they wanted those clients, you know, those tourists to come back. And those tourists that were coming and they were looking around Venice and saying, man, it doesn't look so old. You know, our buildings, our old buildings in London, they're all black and these are not black, of course, because they didn't have as much um, industry in Venice. They had Murano, which polluted a little bit. Um, and so they, they painted them black to make them look a little older because this notion that a building that's old should have a black patina on it uh, was kind of accepted. So, uh, but for me, that gave me pause because I thought to myself, you know, what are you going to do with it? And they said, well, we're going to leave it because that, that pollution was painted on by an artist. And I said, well, but so if it's painted on by an artist, then it's, then you leave it because it's kind of quote unquote intentional. But if it's painted on by the sky, then you take it off. And that to me is really revelatory of our idea of what art is and what idea of, of architecture is this, this, this dependence on the authorship, on being able to peg it to a person. That dust that comes from the sky is also a human product. I mean, we made it collectively and it's depositing from the sky onto these buildings, except that we can't put a name on it. So, you know, that is considered unintentional. But it's the same kind of pollution. In fact, these artists were actually trying to emulate the work of work of the of the of the collective sky. So here's another project that I did in in Bolzano uh, in Italy. Um, this is a this is a factory. This is an aluminum factory. Aluminum is the most energy intensive metal to produce. So it is the one that we started recycling first during Mussolini's. Um, administration, they went to the Apennine, to the, to the Alps, to the pre-Alps, where there was a lot of water coming down and they were able to build barrages and make hydroelectric power to, to work these factories. And so this is a factory uh, where, they were, where they were making uh, aluminum, but it was in a region of Italy that was very tricky because, you know, most people don't know in that region, they speak German because that northern part of Italy was actually part of Austria until World War I. And when the Austro-Hungarian Empire lost, they lost that whole part to Italy. And that became incorporated into the Kingdom of Italy. And Mussolini, being a nationalist, wasn't happy about that. And so he sent all these people from the so southern Italy to try to get the northern Italians to start to speak Italian and stop speaking German. Of course, it didn't work, and there was a lot of pushback. And so the German citizens of Bolzano hated this factory and hated this whole plan to essentially, you know, change their culture. And it and it never worked. They're still they still speak German up there. And so, um, you know, they the first thing they could is they demolished this factory. And by two thousand and eight, they were turning it into a, a big um, cultural center. And there was manifest of the contemporary art biennial of Europe. They were doing a big art show in here. This is the machine hall. And so they were cleaning it. They cleaned the whole, you can see the wall on the left is all clean. The wall on the right is half cleaned. And what I said is let, don't clean the back wall. Don't clean the end of the wall. Let me clean that. And so I went in and you can see here, I did 175 different panels and just lifted the dust off of that wall and hung it in front of the wall itself. And here you can see the, the, the factory clock with the, with the electrical duct that's going down over here. That was the clock that everybody was looking at. And you could see the kind of dust imprint that it left around itself. Um, here you can see a, a kind of side view where you can get a feel for the kind of, you know, um, the, the materiality and the texture of this, of this material. So here's a little bit of a close up where you can see the dust. And here's another project. This was a, um, this was a project in, 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 in Southeastern Spain. 
a, a silver mine in southeastern Spain that is an ancient Roman, actually Carthaginian silver mine. And the, the, this is the reason why the Punic Wars happened, because the Romans, as they were growing their empire, they, the, 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 they needed silver to make money, because the more people in the empire, the more money they needed in circulation so that everybody in the empire could feel Roman, so that everybody could have a little bit of silver in their pocket. And so I cast this, you know, different little pieces of this, um, um, of the of this mine, and you can see it here in these strips. It's actually exhibited in um, in Australia because Australia is a big mining mining country, and so actually most of the coal that's burned in China comes from Australia. They're tethered together, the two economies. And so they were very interested in this idea of extraction and uh, from from the earth, and um, so we showed it over there. But what was important for me is again, I did I did this work and then realized during doing the research that actually in Australia they had identified the dust from this mine in Spain as being also in the North Pole. And so in the University of Perth, they, you know, in collaboration with the European Union, they had done these big core samples of the ice and they traced it back to this mine because a byproduct of, of uh, mining silver is lead and lead has a very stable isotope that you can trace and every mine has a different signature. So you can, if you find lead dust, you can trace it back to the mine. So I thought to myself, okay, how far is this? You know, there, there's like, it's it's a very long distance. It's 4,600 kilometers to get there. But actually, when you think about it, the dust from, from the Mediterranean had to come all the way to South America up the North, no, North America, and then up to Greenland. So in fact, the Romans had polluted the world's atmosphere. They had already polluted the world's atmosphere. And at the height of the Roman Empire, they were 70 million people. And their average age was, you know, let's say around 20 years old. So the scale at which they were operating was peanuts compared to the scale at which we're operating today at 8 billion people where people live, you know, well into their 80s, 90s and hundreds without a problem. Um, my grandfather used to say that it was actually really hard to die. You know, he complained that it was hard to die. Um, so, you know, the scale at which we're producing this dust, and we have produced this dust in, in, the, in the last couple hundred years. In fact, when you look at atmospheric pollution, when, 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 when climatologists look at atmospheric pollution, they, after the fall of the Roman Empire in the fourth century, there is background levels of pollution until the Europeans and the Spaniards discover the Inca Empire and basically enslave the Inca to mine the, the, the um, the silver mines of Peru. And it's at that point that they, that atmospheric pollution begins to rise again and it hasn't stopped until the present. So really since the 15th, 16th century is when that pollution starts to rise. And it's really the beginning of a global economy because Europe and China had already run out of silver and it's those silver mines in South America that begin to supply it with silver. And in America, it's the silver mines of Nevada, it's the gold rush. And so um, I became very interested in just our relationship to, to, to the relationship between the earth, the metals, and money. You know, just that, that kind of correlation between how much money there is in circulation and how many people are alive at any one point in order to keep an economy going. And so the gold rush of the United States what really fascinated me in this kind of boom moment of the late 19th century. And all of the money that went from Nevada, from the silver and gold mines of Nevada. By the way, it was the same people that came from Peru. The, 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 Roman, the, the, the Spanish mines in Peru were the, controlled entirely by families from the Basque region of Spain. They spoke Basque. They didn't speak Castilian. And if you go to Nevada today, it's those same families that emigrated from Peru that went to Nevada to exploit the... the um, the, uh, the, the mines in, in Nevada. And there's all these monuments to the Basque contribution to, ne to Nevada. They're the same ones that enslaved the, uh, the, the local population of Native Americans to, to work the mines in, uh, in, in Nevada.
And so all that gold rush came to this building over here, which at one point had a third of the of all of the cash in the United States in it in San Francisco. And uh, San Francisco, as you all know, had this massive earthquake in 1906, 1907, fires. It was all leveled except this building, which was really well built because the architects knew that this was a seismic zone and it survived and it survived because it was full of gold. So um, I did a project here that is now at SF MoMA in their, in their collection. And I cleaned this building. I wanted to clean this building. Of course, when you go to it, it doesn't have a lot of dust in it. You know, everything's been clean. It's been turned into a historic monument. And the first thing that people do when they turn into a historic monument is they flush all the pollution down the drain. But of course, in between the ceiling and the roof, the, the kind of attic area, this is the chimney. If you look over here, this chimney over here, this, this is the square chimney that I went through. And you can see in it that there's a little bit of black um, dust on it. So we cast those chimneys and this is the two rooms, essentially, they were the two chimneys. And now you can go into them and kind of be inside the chimney, be inside the dust and, and, and be contained into this, into, this, into this atmosphere where you can begin to experience and the, 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 the dust as a material, but also, you know, the, what, what happens with the latex is, you know, the way I, I, I present it with casting light on it, it acquires this kind of golden color. And so, you know, I like that contrast between the fact that this was the pollution necessary to make the gold and the, and the kind of returning it to that, to that kind of gold, um, that, that kind of gold feel. So here you have some images of that and, and some of the openings there. So I began to think about, okay, you know, I'm, I'm doing these casts of buildings all over the world but how do they hold together? What's the relationship between all these things, right? I mean, I was thinking, okay, well, we have like kind of both local and global pollution, but how, what is a framework that I can use to think about this? And I became very attracted to the work of Leo Schmidt who had been mapping the Berlin Wall. And the Berlin Wall, when I say Berlin Wall, we all think Berlin, we think of the wall in Berlin, but he actually realized that most of the wall is actually no longer in Berlin. It's, it's all over the world. And so these are the little hotspots of where the, where, where the Berlin Wall is today. It's spread all over the world. So here is a work of architecture that began all in one place and is now in many places at once and over time in different places at once. So it, it made me start to think about the work that I was doing, each of the pieces, each of the casts of these monuments in the ethics of dust as maybe relating to a larger object, to a larger, maybe imaginary conceptual object. But here you can see, you know, this is how you encounter this Berlin Wall now. This is how you encounter that imaginary object that is the Berlin Wall. Look at it right here. This is, this is like in a parking lot in, in the, you know, the British Army Museum uh, here at UVA. There is a piece of the Berlin Wall better taken care of inside of a glass, you know, uh, enclosure so that it doesn't, so people don't spray paint it. It's more treated like a museum object. So it's all over, over the place. And it, of course, it means different things in different places, but there's a piece of it in front of the UN headquarters, right? This is really about that kind of Western capitalism, democracy, you know, narrative. And, and those values are associated with a, with a fragment of the Berlin Wall. And those values really were values that are, emerged because it was distributed. Like we associate those fragments of the Berlin Wall with a triumph of, you know, liberal democracy because they became fragments. Had, if the wall was stay, stayed in Berlin, we would be thinking of it as, you know, communism. And this has happened, this kind of distribution of monuments has happened to many, many monuments. And some of them are very, very famous, like, you know, the Parthenon in, 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 uh, in Greece. You know, the Parthenon in Greece, if you go to Greece, most of it is not there. The many pieces are in London, which is the point of big contention between the Brits and, and the Greeks. But there's pieces also at the Vatican and there's pieces in, 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 uh, in Holland. But actually, when you go to, if you go to Athens itself and you go up the Acropolis, most of the Parthenon is not up there. They've moved it down the hill to this museum designed by Bernard Schumi. So most of the museum is actually down at the bottom. So where is the Parthenon? This to me is very, very interesting because 
when you think about it conceptually, it gives you a kind of idea that architecture, we have this notion that architecture has to be all in one place. All the materials have to be all in one place, all at the same time. But in reality, the most famous works of architecture are not all in one place, all at the same time. The materials are strewn about. They're a, a concatenation of different materials and temporalities strewn about in, in across space and time. And that's how I started to think about my own work. But, but really, this was the, 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 the kind of the, the moment where it kind of uh, you know flashed in my mind was this uh, th this project, which was a, a project um, that I did in London. This, of course, everybody knows Big Ben. This is the 19th century Gothic revival building, and the reason why it's Gothic revival is because it is attached to a real Gothic building, which is this thousand-year-old building called Westminster Hall. And if you can see over here, this arch over here, it's the same, this little arch over here. And this is Westminster Hall. Now this was government before it burnt down, um, but before I, we, and so when it burnt, this all burnt down and then they built this, you know, Big Ben uh, right after that in, in the 1830s. Now, Westminster Hall, I just want to pause for a second because it is an incredible building because it, it, it has been in operation as a government building for over a thousand years. That's quite remarkable just in and out of itself because I always say architecture is this fantastic technology. Can you imagine like your cell phone lasting a thousand years? Can you imagine being able to use a technology for a thousand years? It's, it's unthinkable, right? And, and architecture, because of its partly because of its simplicity, its technical simplicity, it has been able to last a tremendously long time. And along that time frame, it picks up meaning. And that I think is very important. Um, and things happen in it. And we have to look at what happened in it. In this particular building, it's important for all of us around the world because this is the building where a monarch, Charles I, who, by the way, was just looking around in the middle of the 17th century and said to himself, well, I got to be a modern country. And who's the most modern country of them all? France. And what kind of government do they have? An absolute monarchy. So we got to establish an absolute monarchy in the United Kingdom. And he said, you know, I'm being dragged down by all this politicking with Parliament and the House of Lords and the House of Commons. And this is just a big, you know, uh, uh, standing in the way of expediency and modernity. I, I want to dissolve these two chambers. Of course, his ancestors has, had signed the Magna Carta, which gave power to, to Parliament. And Parliament put together a militia, and they went and seized him and put him on trial. And they found him guilty of treason against the state, and they condemned him to death. And they killed him. They cut his head off. So it was a revolution. It was a regicide. People in Europe were shocked that the British killed their own king. Nobody could believe this. Of course, Cromwell comes after that and all the positives and negatives of that. But what the, the big lesson here for all the monarchs around Europe was that they could be held accountable and that they the law also applied to them. The law was above king. And so, of course, we ritualistically king, we kill the king every four years, we have presidents, and we, we impose a limit on them. But this idea that the presidents are actually also held to account, and, and are not scot free comes from the British. And, and we have to, you know, acknowledge that that our kind of modern conception of modern democracy really owes a lot to, to the British model. Um, and certainly for the United States, you know, the United States being a British colony inherits a lot of these, a lot of the, this history and this conceptualizing and Thomas Paine was going back and forth between the UK and, 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 uh, and the United, United States and France. But when in the 18, 1834, the all of the uh, surrounding of Parliament burns down, all of London comes out to try to save this building, because it meant so much because it meant, it was like this emblem, this symbol of the people. And so parliamentary estates, which is the, the, the kind of government agency that deals with all of the buildings of, of the government, 
uh, they wanted to, they, they're constantly restoring parliament. And so they were restoring the, um, the, the, the interior and they had a plan to clean the interior. And so I collaborated with them to say, okay, let's clean it with latex. Let's, let's save the latex. Let's save the latex and then exhibit the latex back. And so this was a commission. This was a very long process. I'm making it very simple over here, but this was over six years of work to go through so many you know, government regulations and committees and, and approvals. Um, you, you, this is part of the process over here where you can see the dark stone and the clean stone. As we were going along, we had to work with very small pieces um, because this is, a, this is a working building and, and they, they, they had a plan in place that we had to be out of there in six hours should the monarch die because that's where they lay in state. So we, we had to, you know, technically it was very complicated. We had to take the pieces off site, then we had to put them back together off site and put them back in, in the building itself in front of the wall where it came from. Nobody has any evidence of this wall having ever been cleaned. My suspicion is that it was probably clean, cleaned right after the fire, but who knows, uh, but still has a ton of dust on it. And here you can see the dust pulled away from the wall and shown together. Now, for me, what was important about this is if you look at the floor, you know, there's these plaques where you see these are the plaques that mark the trial of Charles I, the lying estate of Winston Churchill, the lying estate of King George. So, so these are the these are these tell the story of humanity through big personalities, sovereigns. And I was more interested in, in having this be a place where there could be a common object, a kind of common um, story to be told, a common product, the thing that we did together. And that's the dust, you know, for me, that that dust is a kind of collective work that, that, that came in through the door because this door was always kept open. And in fact, there's more dust near the door than away from it. And so, um, you know, we, we were granted permission to put this up in 2016 in June. It was supposed to be a very, you know, slow summer, but it turned out that it was the summer of Brexit and the Brexit vote came in the same week that we opened the show. So all of a sudden this became a site of tremendous political tumult. Um, you know, there was newspaper reporters over here. There were politicians back and forth. This is, this is the place, this is the main entrance to parliament. So up these stairs is the the house of lords and and through this break in the in the latex which we had to leave open because that's the entrance to the house of commons so in order to get in and out of parliament they go through this building and so part of it was to show that but but what happened with this great event this great traumatic event for for the uk and for europe it kind of tested what europe was all about um and it's still people are still processing was that this work kind of became the the symbol of it all, and it was written up in the in the newspaper as you know a shroud for for the UK, all sorts of analogies, and there was a lot of interest in 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 it for various museums, and so the decision was made after a lot of discussion back and forth to actually cut this work. And so we cut pieces, and then these pieces were sent to different museums around the UK. And so uh, Wales has a piece, Northern Ireland has a piece, Scotland has a piece, England has a piece. And normally when you take an artwork and you cut it up, you destroy it. But here we felt that in fact it was much more uh, uh, meaningful to, to distribute it and uh, logical to where my thinking had come at the time, which was this idea that monuments really are distributed monuments that 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 when you really perceive and understand what a monument is once it becomes distributed and in this case for me you know obviously it made me start to think about a kind of great collective monument that we're making together which is this atmosphere that the atmosphere is a a a, a cultural object that is going to last for thousands of years, because all that dust stays volatile up there for thousands of years, and then it's going to deposit in different, you know, all around, all around the earth, and leave a mark. And that that is a different kind of monument. It's a kind of geological monument that we're making together. And I think that uh, once we begin to think of it as a cultural reality and as a real material reality, we we can actually begin to deal with it differently, care for it differently, and begin to 
think of our actions and our contributions to it and how we preserve this monument that we've created uh, in, a, in a different way. So I um, will stop there and then I think we can, because I, I realize we're, we're running out of time and maybe we can just turn to some Q&A if you, if you all want. So thank you very much for your attention.